at 6.30. We have mics on. Yeah, we do. I'll call this meeting to order. Kevin, can we get a roll call, please? Council Member Gerard. Here. Council Member Husnick. Here. Council Member Monson. Here. Council Member Bystrom. Here. And Mayor Bain. Here. <coughs> Ask all those that are able to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. First item on our agenda tonight is an open forum. Do we have anybody <coughs> signed in for open forum? Just a reminder for everybody, we are in workshop format tonight, so we are not taking official action on any agenda items. This is intended to be an informal working session. So you'll see that format as we go through here. And one item for open forum, Terry Steenblock. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Terry Steenblock, and I live at 568 South Shore Drive. And I also serve as the chair on the Parks, Lakes, and Trails Commission. And I'm here to speak briefly about the Communications and Recreation Coordinator position this evening. So earlier this year, I had made a budget recommendation to the rest of the Parks, Lakes, and Trails Commission for a position related to communications and outreach to provide some administrative support for the Park and Recreations Department. And that recommendation was supported by the rest of the commission. Um, there were a variety of reasons for making this recommendation, but I did want to share one, um, one of the reasons why I made this recommendation. As chair, I often monitor the various social media channels for parks, lakes, and trails topics. And all too often, I see postings and questions from residents wondering what's happening within the community. Many of them want to know where they can find information related to parks, lakes, and trails. And they're asking about various recreational opportunities. And sadly, many a times I see recommendations from people advising others to go to surrounding communities because nobody knows either what activities are available within the community, how to get involved with those activities, where to find additional information, and which community group is responsible for it. And so I think if we had a centralized and coordinated uh, communication resource with a mechanism to deliver that communication, it would alleviate uh, many of the issues that we're seeing today. Um, I also attended one of the strategic planning sessions and some of this feedback came out there as well. In the session I attended, Parks, Lakes, and Trails, along with communications, bubbled up as two of the top three items in that session. There was an express need for the city as a whole to have a more robust and coordinated communication effort, which included a variety of communication mediums that could help create an overall awareness of what Forest Lake has to offer and how individuals can learn more about what Forest Lake has to offer. And while a high percentage of the city communication is related to parks and recreational activities, I've become, as I've become more involved with the city and hear or read more community feedback, I think it's apparent there needs to be a coordinated communication resource for the city as a whole, which this position would accomplish. Um, there's also a high demand for improvements to parks and trails, and currently all the work in the Park and Recreation Department is completed by one staff member. Alleviating some of the administrative duties will allow time to focus on park and trail improvement identified um, in the next five years. So the Parks, Lakes, and Trail team has been working on our strategic plan, both short and long term, um, and that would dovetail nicely into this. Um, I know that there is a balance, and I, like other residents, expect you to balance the needs of our community with the need to be fiscally responsible for our tax dollars. So the parks and recreation area is an area that's limited to one position, and there's no succession plan in place. And the overall city communication is spread across a variety of city employees positions uh, which does not allow for coordinated and strategic city communications as a whole. So I feel that the investment in this position is a relatively small from a budget standpoint, 
yet it allows the city to effectively communicate and provide some stability and succession planning as we move forward. From an economic standpoint, I know that we want to be able to draw people and businesses into the community. And one of the most effective ways of doing that is through transparent and meaningful communication. So I thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight, and I hope that you will consider this position as you work on your final budget recommendations. Thank you. Yes, questions? Good. <coughs> no. All right, thank you. <coughs> okay, we'll turn things over to Patrick. 2020 budget items. Yes, um, before we get to the individual items listed on the agenda, I want to point out a few things that and and demonstrate something. And on your desk tonight was uh, we talked about a communications kind of a points to talk about or a flyer to, that we can uh, tell the community why we're doing these things. And this is the first draft of that. It, um, I thought the staff did a very nice job. We may need to change the green color a little bit, but that's. Uh, but I think it tells the story. I think uh, uh, it spells out what we're what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do that. Um, so we'll continue to work on that. So if you take a look at that and if you have any comments, please let us know. Um, the second, if you can turn this turn this on for me, I'll show you a tool that we're going to use tonight to try to balance the budget the way you like it or want to get it to. Um, uh, this form has <coughs> some of the issues listed in uh, in the uh, cells here that we may talk about tonight. But I want to go back to the refinancing. Um, when we had Ellers here last uh, last meeting, uh, they mentioned <coughs> that we were going to save a significant money on uh, refunding. Now we're still going to save that, and I, I placed a memo on your desk today. But um, part of the issue that we ran into is that uh, the city in the past has not had a one-to-one -one relationship of its debt service to uh, the levy that supports that debt service. It actually uses fund balance to pay that off. And sooner or later, and it's coming sooner than later, debt ser uh, fund balances run out. And so I believe we're at that point. Uh, so we haven't been levying it. So. Part of the savings, or most of the savings, will be taken up this year by correcting that situation. And let me go down here on this little <laughs> chart here. Um, if you see the City Hall Bond 208, uh, the last year payment and the first suggested payment for debt service was $1,411,000. Well, we've taken that out and substituted that with the $1.38 million, um, which is what Ellers will tell us that's going to be. We've also, if you look at the YMCA debt service, 325, uh, 570 is what we originally budgeted for the debt service as far as the levy goes. That will not meet the debt service payment this next year. 600,000 will meet the debt service payment next year. So we've included that. And finally, we are proposing, as we all know, the $4 million street bond. Uh, that's at $320,000. So if you take that all into consideration, uh, what that does to the proposed levy is makes it a 10.66% uh, levy increase. Uh, I think tonight we can discuss ways to make that look better. And I'll give you, a, I'll run through what this does. So it totals up the levy, what it is, what the increase, what the percentage increase. And then below we can see the immediate impact on a, three different styles of homes, three, 250,000, 350,000, and 550,000. So what that levy will do to each level up there. So for example then, let's take the police captain. If we fund that, and I'll take the worst scenarios first. No, let's do the recreation since we have, you know. Um, if we fund that for a full year, we would add $74,300 to the budget. Patrick, can you, what is column E? Column E is the proposed, column E is what we originally proposed in, to you in the, this year's budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the last column is what we'll hopefully come up with. So we added 74,300. So if you go through this, then you can see that it's raised that to an 11.39% increase. Um, if we say, let's just say we reduce the pavement improvement plan since we're doing bonding to zero. 
and what does that do to us? So we eliminate 250,000. It takes it down to 8.23%. So what I hope to do is take a, a mix of some of these items and talk about them and what we want to put in or take out of the budget as it is. And I do have some suggestions for that. Uh, and I don't know if you want me to go through those now or wait until we have these discussions on each individual item. So. Maybe let's um, survey council on some of the individual items that were in our materials and just maybe touch base, see if there's any questions on those items before we get into the um, calculation and full budget impact. Does that make sense? Um, so items, items that had been presented to council um, beyond the, um, the new calculations related to debt, um, the, the debt service that Patrick just walked us through. Um, it, we had information received this um, in this last week from Ch uh, Chief Peterson related to the police position. Um, there was, a, in previous um, documents, a um, com the communications and recreation position, that out position outline was provided. We've also been provided information on the categorization of roads. Um, and then we've had the bonding presentation. So I think maybe before we get into the math and the calculation, maybe good to circle back on any of these individual topics that council may want some clarification on or, um, or areas where council maybe feels like they've had enough information and are ready to jump into the math. Looking for feedback from council? In our last discussion, I, um, I, owe, I owe Chief Peterson an apology. We teed up a very important conversation with about five minutes of agenda time. Um, and since then, you know, council has had an opportunity to review another memo from um, Chief Peterson with some clarification. And certainly he is here if we have questions on that. Um, open to feedback on what kind of a budget topics do we need some additional content before we jump into, again, numbers. i just like to address, um, I mean, I guess start with this communication and recreation coordinator position. Um, I, I really feel like this is a valid proposal um, with regard to this particular position. I think it kind of fills a dual need. Um, um, that need has become you know, evident, I think, to council, but I think was reinforced during our strategic planning process. And what I, what I like about this mix of positions is that it, um, it, it feels like it allows us time to sort of grow into needs in both regards here. Um, obviously, it's gonna be a, kind of a unique skill set, but um, I think it, it, it you know, rather than taking a look at those in isolation of one another and, you know, maybe a half-time communication coordinator and three-quarter time rec um, assistant or whatever, um, kind of the morphing of this, I think it, f it feels responsible to me um, in terms of movement around this particular need that we've identified within the city. So that's my first comment on that. So I will. Additional, stop. additional. Comments or clarification on the communication and recs coordinator position? I guess I'll chime in to agree with um, Council Member Bystrom on her comments around this. There's a, an identified strong strategic need both around parks and both around communication. I too like the dual functionality of the role. Um, my challenge on most of tonight's conversation is not so much which is important, but which combination of items together work together to a budget amount that's palatable for this first year. Um, and so I guess I'll reserve further kind of judgment on where I think this particular position fits until we're looking into the broader picture, because again, to me, the magic is going to be in what what combination of investments are we able to make into 2020 that work together to a palatable number versus all of these areas are important and which is going to have to wait a little bit. So, well. I'm 
Mayor Bain, glad you said that because it was, I, I don't want it to feel like we're hitting one department against another department. They're all important. Um, like you said, coming to the conclusion of what is the best kind of package together for the city that's still fiscally responsible but meets the needs and meets the needs of what we heard um, definitely in strategic planning and um, as Terry Steenblock mentioned in the beginning, what you see around comments around communication. And I don't think that's any person's you know, lack of doing their responsibility. I think it's the infrastructure of what we have in the city is, isn't, we're growing and it's, it's not meeting the needs of, of what is needed. So that's all I want to say on that. Okay, other items that, um, kind of other topics or questions that before we kind of get into some more of the math. I'm not hearing anything, if I may, um, I would like to talk through, we have in front of us um, a street project um, plan, and I think it would be helpful to just walk through. Sure. Um, and Ryan, maybe you can walk us through scenario. We have a page in front of us without bonding and a page in front of us with bonding. Um, maybe talk to us about how you got to this point, how these items were prioritized, um, and maybe just a little bit of discussion. If we can, is it possible to pull this up on the screen, what we have in front of us? No, we don't have that. It's, okay. We just have it now, so. Okay, very good. Could we include it, though, as a future um, amend the packet to include it just so the public is sure. able to see it. That would be helpful. Good. Ryan, go ahead. Mayor, City Council, in front of you is a, a scenario that, uh, or a real project exercise that we went through to see uh, how it would, the, much further you would be getting on your street infrastructure if you were to bond or not bond. I would not get married to these roads, and I would not like to even discuss all the roads because in years, depending on how funding plays out, as we get down the list, some of those roads might not be on that list because something else took priority. So this was taking a snapshot on the roads that were you know, rated six or lower now uh, when the last road ratings were done and prioritizing areas that are requiring a lot of extra maintenance with public work. So we basically finalized an area to start calculating Thursday. And what you have in front of you is what those results of that look like in the first two pages, the first page is the actual dollar amounts in the specific street without bonding, so running a status quo with your current, current uh, budgets. Second page is a map, colored map, just to show you what years 20, 20, 21, and 22, what we'd actually touch. And then if we did apply bonding, then it has the streets and dollar amounts, uh, and then a colored map, and you can see we were able to significantly touch a lot more roads. Uh, one, of the, one of the roads earlier in, in the exercise is a little wider and it include almost $400,000 worth of trail improve, or replacement. That's none of it's ADA compliance. You probably can't even take a wheelchair down the segment of the, this. I just drove it again this morning and I still can't believe what I do see that's sitting there in deferred maintenance uh, and it's adjacent to schools. So it kind of lines up with priorities as identified in your ADA transition plan, what you've heard in your strategic planning and stuff like that, but really the difference at the end of the day is almost 12 and, a little over 12 and a half miles versus less than five in three years. And when you look at what's been identified on the map, there's areas uh, that we wanna get to next year that aren't being, being accounted for or aren't gonna be touched until 22 if we don't bond. That's just what it is. I mean, it's nothing pretty. It's local street. Uh, you can go drive any one of these roads right now and you'll get your own opinion and I'm sure it'll support what's in the packet. It's helpful, helpful to see. Um, I think it's also maybe important to n note that um, you know, we've had a fair amount of discussion at co council at this level and also certainly previous council mm -hmm. had a fair amount of discussion around the intersection, the pedestrian, the need for a pedestrian facility at Goodview in 97, and even with a bonding scenario, that still does not include that funding for that pedestrian facility. So we still, even under this bonding scenario, do still have some gaps. Um, but certainly, um, it's nice to see in the bonding scenario that there's that much more progress being made on some pretty sizable backlog of deferred maintenance. Mayor. 
Uh, please. Ryan, uh, or maybe Patrick, I'm not sure, sure who. How do we get this initial little over a million dollars a year? Where does that come from without bonding? Uh, it's a com right now, the majority of our local dollars are from the franchise fee, franchise fee that's on the electric and gas utilities that come into this uh, this fund uh, solely for paving. That's around, what, 700 and some odd thousand? 770. 770. And then the rest comes from uh, the state and the local. No? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No state dollars in these, these figures. And that's, and again, another reason why it's important that the city is in a position to bond because our state dollars are tied up on our cooperative agreement projects or the Goodview project next year. So three years of funding, state aid construction allotment goes to, to the Goodview. And then we have in construction 23, County Road 33, which will have a local share. Don't know what that will be yet. It's actually got a voicemail today. They want to call, talk about the scope and vision of 33. Uh, and then we'll have in 25, did that email not get floated around? Just curious. The whole state aid breakout, where oh. that money's going to go. I think it did. Yes. Yes. So you can see all the items that are identified in the state aid, um, which are totally a separate mm -hmm. projects, money sources, versus what we're talking about right here tonight. So to get to the 1.17 1 is 770 of franchise fees. Uh, $250,000 of a buy-down of fund reserves, and then a contribution from stormwater, sewer, and water to do repairs within those projects. Thank you. Have we historically supplemented with the buy-down and fund reserves paving, or is that? This would be the first year that we're carrying about a one and three-quarter million dollar uh, fund balance, and so $250,000 now is might as well spend it now versus waiting five years and then it's not worth as much. So we're just trying to get creative of our fund balance that we have and trying to get a little more done. Thank you. So as we're talking about catch up items of where we've historically used fund balance, we've got this $250,000 and then additionally, the supplement that's been happening on the debt service as well. Correct, but the, the difference here is is that the $250,000 for paving, that's a reasonable use of fund balance because it's basically a one-time expense and a one-time revenue, right. yep. whereas supplementing bond uh, payments with surplus uh, is a continuing payment for the life of the bond, which is usually 15 years that the city uses. So that's really not a particularly good idea. Perfect. I just think it's good to bring up one more time that no property tax dollars pay for roads. You know, currently it's franchise fees and storms, you know, storm, sewer and water paying for parts of the work being done and then a buy down a fund balance. So really right now zero dollars of property tax dollars go to roads. Yeah. You know, and that's that's our main gap here of kind of why we've gotten to where we've gotten. It's a good point that we're going to have to continue to make. Okay, so surveying here kind of topics, um, we should, um, let, let's circle back on the police captain position if we can. Um, can I ask one more question about yeah, the please. roads? Um, how did you prioritize, is it, was it the rating? How did you prioritize? I mean, I, you know, when I look at the colorful map with all the orange on it, you know, relative to the proposal with the bonding, how did you prioritize those with the bonding, just based on the road rating, six road or rating? lower? Okay, six or lower. Yep. Okay. Some of them were pushed in different years based on the needs now. Okay. Uh, Ryan will give me a pretty good map of where the, the six, five, and lower are, but then in the field with my staff, see of how much <coughs> dollars they're putting into patching and, and maintenance that way, we kind of shift stuff around that way that this road probably needs to go before this road. It may be a, a four, but this one looks like a five, but 
staff spent you know a hundred ton of patching okay. uh, last year. It just kind of you play that game between what he sees for his pacer ratings and then what my staff sees you know out in the field. So when I say the discussion of the road finalized the priorities of roads to be calculated, that's what all went into that getting to that point and Dave saying try to break these into these years and those and those years. Okay. And that's kind of where you fall with the dollar amounts. Yeah, and just to follow up on the maintenance. So the national uh, the Minnesota League of Cities uh, has a statistic that where every dollar you spend on maintenance on a road, it saves seven dollars in repairs. So the more you maintain your roads, the more you save in the long run in the in, in repairs and maintenance that way. Yeah, being proactive, that's what it amounts to. Are there questions related to roads? Very good. Um, perhaps next let's discuss the um, police captain position. There was some initial information in your packets last meeting. We ran out of time. Um, and then since that time, there's been some amendments um, to Chief's plan, and um, maybe Chief, you want to just walk us through um, kind of the significant changes of what's changed and um, kind of what's, what's in the current proposal? Sure. Uh, Mayor and City Council members, good evening. As I mentioned in last week's budget workshop, my recommendation going forward in 2020 is to implement a second captain's position in order to more efficiently redistribute the workload responsibilities and provide additional direct supervision to our personnel. The captain currently has a span of control of 11 direct subordinates that report to him. The span of control is too wide and inefficient. Currently, our four patrol sergeants have been tasked with additional administrative responsibilities that take away from their time patrolling the streets and directly supervising their patrol teams. With the increased calls for service, we have observed from the opioid crisis, mental health calls, and the community's desire for additional traffic enforcement, this restructure is imperative to providing these services to our community. The organizational restructuring of the command staff that I presented to you will allow the patrol sergeants to focus on day-to-day -day supervision of patrol officers and helps ensure that line staff are being adequately supported. It would provide a more efficient span of control for the captains and provide a positive platform for the future of secession planning. In the next five to six years, we will be observing five retirements with four of those in our current command staff. With my recommended restructuring of the command staff, it would, be, it would position ourselves in developing our future leaders in our department. As I mentioned last week, the cost to fully implement this recommendation for a full year was approximately $143,000. In all actuality, the process to fully implement this rec recommendation would not occur um, until mid-year which um, I would be shooting for about July of 2020, which is a savings of approximately $71,000 from the originally stated 143,000. With the assistance of our senior accounting clerk, Brenda Hoffman, I also project a savings from the patrol officer overtime budget in 2020 of approximately $40,000. These sav savings would start in January of 2020 due to a change in the patrol officer work schedule. We have been de developing this work schedule, schedule for over two years now. When the restructuring is fully implemented in July of 2020, we will observe even further overtime cost savings due to improved efficiencies in our police operations. My projections are an increase to the 2020 police budget with all the um, things that I brought to your attention here in moving parts of approximately $32,000 um, if this recommendation is implemented. Looking forward to 2021, the overtime savings would continue going forward along with additional police presence on the streets. <coughs> you can uh, refer back to your memo. There's some additional information in there for you, but if you have any questions for me, feel free to ask them. Chief, one question. Could you um, expand on, you, you mentioned um, this restructure allows for more officers on the streets. Can you expand on how, to, how does that happen? So right now with the patrol sergeants 
having these additional administrative responsibilities and duties that they're currently taking on because the captain is just overwhelmed with um, all these duties and responsibilities, they're assisting, so I've re redistributed some of that workload. Unfortunately, it's kind of a domino effect where they spend more time in the office working on those administrative duties. Um, the day sergeants are spending much more time in the office, and so if we implement this captain's position, my recommendation, I would re redistribute the, that workload between the two captains, and that way we can get those four sergeants back on patrol um, and seeing them out there and having more of a police presence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chief, um, along those lines, and, and I have no idea how to run police, or but I'm very ignorant about it, so please take that with a grain of salt. With the additional sergeant time on there, is it possible to push the new patrol officer to 2021, let's say, do the captain part this year and a year down the road? Put the captain, you know, they've got a lot of good positions. I'm just trying to figure out how can we. Sure, yeah, I understand. Uh, the reason why I feel that all of it um, could and should happen within the same year is that if we implemented that captain's position, we'd be taking either a sergeant out of their rotation and shift and or an officer out of their rotation and shift, um, which would leave us with less police presence out on the road. So being an organization that works 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, um, you have all these moving parts. So in a department our size, we have one sergeant, three officers working at one time all day, every day minus vacation, comp time, sick time, military leave, those types of things. So to, um, to further maybe explain how I'd like to in implement this if this recommendation is approved is we will start the hiring process in uh, January or February. A hiring process for a police officer can take anywhere from uh, three months to up to uh, six months depending on how quickly we can get that um, going, get the ball rolling, and also uh, with um, how many applicants you have, candidates, and those types of things. I would like to get that officer in place before um, looking at a promotional process for sergeant and then for a captain's position as an appointment. So how I envision it is the process for the hiring for the officer might take, um, you know, the first four to five months of the year, they would be hired, go through a um, FTO process, a field training process that can take up to um, anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks. Once they are ready to go on patrol, what we call solo patrol, where they can you know, be out on the, on the road patrolling our streets on their own, that's when I would um, start the, well, the promotional process for the sergeant would be earlier, but I'd want that to take place in July, June, July, or August of um, the next year, along with the captain's appointment. I'd really like to have it happen right before the 4th, 4th, of, July, uh, 4th of July. Point of maybe clarification, so it's part of it's a scheduling thing you have. Yes. There's four shifts today, essentially 12-hour shifts. It's not quite 12-hour shifts, but um, a day shift and a night shift, and so there's four, um, and there's one sergeant assigned to each, and you're not able to have a, a shift without a supervisor, essentially, right? Which yes, is kind of, you to need, simplify You need that. to keep that four sergeant number. Yes, for that direct supervision. Right. To simplify it, let's say it's a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift and a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift, and um, you have certain individuals that are working on a Monday or a Tuesday. Those other individuals that maybe work a Wednesday and Thursday are off on Monday and Tuesday. And it kind of, you know, um, continues that way. So there's always somebody on duty. Are there <laughs> That's a different conversation. <laughs> Any uh, other questions for the chief comments on the proposal? Mm -hmm. Am I uh, in, in, in just weighing in on, a, on an opinion here? Um, 
it's a, a, attractive. So I'm I'm interested in so I've been interested in this topic all along. Um, th this it becomes perhaps even more attractive given the opportunity for a mid-year promotion and then the additional overtime savings. Um, but just like all of the other conversations we've had, it's it's you know which one is going to fit this year and which one has to wait. Um, I kind of put this into that same category, but certainly to be able to put have more of that sergeant time out onto the street, um, direct supervision of staff, more interactions. You know, you've got that extra support for call volume is attractive because we've heard call volumes are increasing. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, we do uh, strategically need to keep succession planning in mind, given you've got a pretty heavy um, load of planned retirements in the next five years, and that takes some time to backfill and be planful of. Doesn't all have to happen at once, however. So, so I think it's I think it's a little confusing, but uh, kind of the back and forth and who's moving where potentially, and then what you need to kind of build from the bottom up. You really just adding one FTE in 2020. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the captain would come from the implement we have in our staffing. Same with the sergeant. It would be a new police officer hire one FTE. Okay. And that would put us back to our complement of uh, full-time employees that we had back in 2015. Okay. Okay, any other questions for the chief? Thank you. Thanks. Not hearing any, I think, I do think, um, you know, we've, if we look at the items that are illustrated on the spreadsheet that Patrick has in front of us, um, I do think it's helpful to also to just um, kind of focus in on and, and have a little discussion on this code enforcement position. Um, this was a position that was uh, kind of presented to council in one of our first budget workshops. There was a position description and a <coughs> proposed salary range that was given. Um, I don't want to leave any of these positions out for lack of conversation. Was there any questions or clarification that council needed on that particular item? I, you know, we've just heard a lot about the need for code enforcement. So what, what are we talking dollars and cents wise? Can you refresh oh, sure. me? And yeah, then talk a little um, bit about roles and responsibilities. It's included in the budget already. And the code enforcement uh, is about $80,000. Okay. Code, say that one more time. How code much? enforcement cost is $80,000 $80, and it's included in the budget at this point. And communication rec was mid 50s. The communication rec all in with benefits is uh, 74 5 or 74 3 basically. And that is not included. That is not included. The captain is not included. And the captain's not included. Okay. And the captain's at 147. Right? What exactly would the duties be for the code enforcement? I mean, it seems like it's kind of blatantly obvious, but. Yeah, it's, it, that's a position where we're going to have to create the structure and what it's, what it's going to be. Um, it can be anywhere from property maintenance, you know, yards that are bad shape or things, or look for uh, zoning uh, type of issues. So it, it's going to be pretty widespread of, a, of duties. Anything that's out there that we need to look at, uh, Donovan will help, help him in the code uh, zoning uh, Hopefully you'll see if there's some building issues out there. You can tell an inspector, but also the major complaints we're getting right now are, are the yards and the upkeep of properties and people not wanting to live next to a lot of debris and stuff in, in the yards. We're not talking about, you know, if your gutter is a little loose or things like that yet, but we're talking basic, try to keep the city look a little cleaner. Patrick, who responds to those now? It depends Just who's on available. the day. Yeah, mostly Donovan does most of that right now, beyond his planning and zoning duties. Mm -hmm. um, but again, and we when we have a summer intern, which is also included in the budget, they often go out there and do the same thing. So, and and when you get to code enforcement for properties like that, that's really a good weather kind of position. And um, it's been my experience when you create a program like this, it's. Uh, you have an idea that they'll go from quadrant to quadrant inspecting, but really what it turns out to be in the first few years are people find out we have it and they're going to start calling, so it's going to be more complaint-based, and that'll keep us plenty busy. So, Yeah, because right now it's a reactive Please. situation. Okay. I mean, it's not a 
it's not a proactive, and I know that. It's just, it just seems like a situation where you got somebody running around giving the impression they're snooping, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of yeah. And I don't want to, I, I, I wouldn't want to see that. I want to <clears throat> make sure that we're working with uh, residents and, and taxpayers. And, uh, and like I said, usually that's what's going to happen is we'll get enough complaints to keep us busy. We won't set up an inspection neighborhood by neighborhood or block by block. It probably, if we ever got there, it would be five, six years easily before we even get there. So in, in your opinion, is this a growing issue for the city or? Oh yeah, I believe so. Okay. I believe so. And do we have the um, kind of, I know we've talked a little bit about sort of that whole overall planning zoning structure. Um, do we feel like we have a support structure for that individual in place? Now we have, uh, and one of the challenges, like I, I said at the beginning here, is that it's going to take some time for us to put this kind of program together and who's going to supervise it and how it's going to be structured. Uh, that may lend you an opportunity to, to uh, reduce the, the first year costs on this because it's going to take us a few, to, a few months to get this up and running and then um, get it all, you know, forms and hiring and all that. So there may be an opportunity to implement this in like the half year or something and that could okay. save you some money that way. Because you'd, you'd have to form some kind of a system of credentials. I mean, you just can't take somebody off the street. And no, what you, what you usually look for in this position is somebody, what, what I, and not to go back to everything that I used to do, but what, I, what we used to try to do in the couple places we've done this is uh, get, um, <coughs> Firemen who are on their off days, you know, most a lot of them work 24 on 48 off, and looking for part-time work. And some of those firemen have inspection duties at their fire department, and so they are used to the inspection process and filling out forms and things. So we will try to see if we can get somebody like that. And if not, if we don't find somebody, we have to train somebody, and hopefully they'll have a good enough background that they can understand the philosophy. And you know, uh, you know, you're looking more for compliance than punishment. And so that's kind of the outline of what we'd be doing. And education also. Yeah, and, and the question then, if we go to like the fireman <coughs> model, then we, then we go to two part-time guys instead of a full-time guy. You know? mm -hmm. So it's just, this whole program needs to be developed over the next you know, six months or eight months here before we get it all started. Okay. I'm just concerned about the, the perception of the whole thing. Perception's so, huge. It, it, so it's, uh, it needs I mean, to be well deal. managed and Absolutely. well and yeah. hired, and that's one of the roles where hiring the right person is also important. Oh, of, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But okay. also, but also, what is our strategy and communication plan? And yeah, agree. I yeah. completely agree with you. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why I was wondering about kind of overall structure and development of that yeah. supervisory yeah. structure. And the, I'm not. You know, I'm not saying there aren't issues out there because there are. Right. No question about it. But it's just how we handle it and, right. and do it right. So yeah, agree. Yeah. So we have, uh, so my question is both, we have the 2020 budget and then we have the ongoing budget after, which is just as concerning. I got 21 and 22 and 23, and I, I know you guys are gonna send me a bill for each of those years. <laughs> so we know the total is going in for a full year. Mm -hmm. If we did something with the code enforcement, it's likely to be not a full year. It Correct. would be the same, would the set, we'll try that again. Would we say the same for the park and rec, or would that be trying to get someone right at the beginning of the year for a full year? Yeah, um, I, since the budget takes effect in January, I doubt that you'll have a full year on, with the park and rec and communications person. You know, that I think we can probably fill faster than, than developing a code enforcement program. So with the way we hire, and it's not that we do it slower or anything, it's, it's probably I wouldn't say until March or April 1st, one of those two, for that type of position. Ideally, it would be nice to have it in place for summer activities, yes. for, or pl even planning sure. for summer activities, for sure. Would a, would a point eight be reasonable there? Or is the savings not so great that, I mean, I'm just trying to think about growing into something. Well, I don't, I don't think that uh, in, in either of these two positions that 
um, a less than full-time position to start will be a bad thing. I think we internally need to grow into some of that stuff too. Okay. So point eight, no. If if you're if you're working 30 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week, no, that's mm -hmm. that's not such a bad thing. And we can evaluate how it's working and if we need more time or less time. Uh, then you can also schedule um, somebody like that maybe more in the summer than you would on the, yeah, the winter years and things like that. So that, it just depends on. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever you allocate, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Right. Could that position flow, ebb and flow kind of with need? You yeah, know, with it greater, can. greater need. It's, it's all the, how we structure it. I mean, yeah. we could hire somebody for eight, nine months and <laughs> some take the winter off if we can find somebody that is interested in that kind of schedule, which when you get to, to that, it may be a little more difficult. But Yeah, and that would be my concern, too. You want to be sure you can hire well there. So. Yeah. That's a very important to hire the right person there too. Right. And, and code enforcement as well, is that, could there be potential for a point eight there? Yeah, I mean, we could easily do that on an hourly basis okay. and, and grow into that and see how that works. That's actually, in my opinion, probably even lends itself more to the part-time than the, the parks and rec and communications person okay. because you can just identify so many hours a week for that function to work. Okay. Who benefits work on the part time then? Is it 30 no. I think it's full time, right? I don't know what qualifies for benefits. It's not, I think it's like 30 35, hours a week, 32. 32 hours? Yeah, a, don't quote me on that, but I know it's not, there's it's less, than, less than full time, you still qualify for benefits. Do we have, um, we don't need to answer this question today, just something to keep in mind. Because these are union positions, do we have restrictions as far as in contract, do we have contract language that restricts our ability to use part-time employees? I know sometimes seasonal is impacted, but we have an ability to. No, we have an ability to put part-time people on. The thing that we would have to do there is, in these two cases particularly, is identify the position, put a job description together, talk to the union about it, and then place it in the salary schedule. But okay. we can do okay. part-time and seasonal, and okay. we do that now, or we can. Perfect, good. Any other, um, I guess, conceptual questions or kind of under, <coughs> does everyone feel like you've got a, a solid <coughs> understanding of the different areas of budget impact that we've been talking about? Maybe for a next step, it'd be helpful to turn attention back to Patrick's spreadsheet um, and walk through this um, calculation. Um, I've had the benefit of sitting side by side with Patrick a couple of times now and kind of looking through how these numbers work out. Um, maybe let's tee this up with next steps. So nothing has to be final until December. Um, it's just that we have a requirement to set our preliminary levy by the end of the month and we have that plan to be on our agenda for our next regular council meeting next Monday. Um, and whatever we set for the general fund, we can't levy higher than that. We can bring that number down. And so Patrick, if you could scroll down in your spreadsheet a little bit. And looking at, I like to look at this as kind of a funnel where everything has come in at the top of we've got all these requests that have come in. And today, if we were to do nothing but to set the preliminary levy at what is currently baked into the plan, we would have a preliminary levy in column F here, item 28, of 10.66%. So I think it's good to start thinking about um, and the original plan that we had looked at at our first draft of our budget was 7.55%, but as you know, we've asked for a couple of additional things. We've added this paving bonding um, situation. We've, um, we've, we've requested information on a couple of additional positions we might wanna fund. Um, and so that's the difference between the 10.66 and the 7.55. And then last year's levy increase was 2.61 as comparison. So I think maybe it's helpful to start thinking at the top line of what's our appetite. Um, I will just be very transparent and say I would love to see this 10.66 number get down closer into the five range if possible. Um, I think that we've got a, a lot of catch up to do, but we're not going to be able to do it all in year one. Um, I'm open to perhaps pushing on the high end of that if we need to make a strong case, but I'm thinking about going back out to the community and we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about the levy increase 
And then we also need to talk about our bonding opportunities. And to me, going in with a bonding conversation with a high levy increase can be a difficult, challenging conversation. So um, I think, I don't know if we need to go down the line right now and say, what's your number, what are you comfortable with? But I think it'd be helpful to kind of walk through this spreadsheet, make some changes, and just start to see what items might start to fit. Um, does that make sense? Can, go ahead. Can we go to the bottom what it's going to cost per homeowner? Ah, uh, thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, I think I think that's key. I mean, I think the bottom line is what is the what is the overall impact on taxpayers? It's somebody can look at ten point six six percent and they can't put that in context. They need to know what this is going to mean to them as a homeowner. Correct. So I think this is helpful. Yeah, that's a kind of a steep number to swallow for one year, I think. It, yes. yeah, that's that's where I'm at with it. I mean, if there's something we could do to... We, we are playing catch-up. I'm just repeating what I just heard. I mean, that's exactly what we've been... And, I, and I've said it a million times, uh, sitting on this council. And uh, But at the same time, I, I think we really need to uh, be pretty prudent in how we, how we do this. And, and as far as the bonding is concerned, it's it's a great opportunity right now with with the cost. It just a, you couldn't come up with a better opportunity. Yeah, that and, that feels like a no-brainer. Yeah, right. I mean, it yeah. really does. Yeah, I just so, can't see that. But, you know, the ten point six six. I I just would like to see something. I would like to see some, some sort of a compromise on that and get that down if we could, if it's possible. So. Well. In terms of um, any other comments on the overall big picture before we jump into some of the detailed adjustments? Any other? I'm all in for the higher number, but and I'm a fiscal conservative, and I, and I want to explain this. If we look back at some of the earlier charts of our mill rate relative to other communities our mm -hmm. size, right. mm -hmm. we are very, very low, and there's a reason because we're so far behind. Um, I'm with you that it's a tough pill to swallow, but whether we medium rise it or take a couple of step functions to get us where we need to be, it's a tough pill to swallow. On the other hand, the economy's in pretty good shape right now. I would think it would be better now than potentially two years down the road. Right. I guess I'm looking at it from the, the respect that, um, you know, the water fund increases and, and, and that we've talked about and had to implement and and uh, the, there was a big number, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so at what point do you not get <laughs> squished in the deal, you know what I mean? I'm with you. So, <laughs> and I, I, I think, I think uh, there's nothing wrong with at least uh, trying to figure out how to be as efficient as possible, as simple as that. Yep. And if we have to go to that number, we have to go to it. And I mean, uh, but um, if we do, we we got to be a we got to we got to get the best bang for our buck, and that's all there's to it. Right. Okay. Well, and we have to stop kicking the can down the road. Well, I, we I, can't. We can't. I we, I, and I'm and I'm I'm right there with Council Member Gerard. I'm pretty conservative when it comes to this kind of thing, but. Um, you know, the unfortunate part is the councils before us have, have left some of these tough decisions to us. And... That I will agree with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, do, do, we, do we move forward boldly or, or do we, you know, cower? Um, and I think a big piece of this is communication, helping our community understand why we are where we are. Um, and... And where it's going, right? And where we're going. And I think we talked a lot, I, I, at least I know I did, and I know many of you did during the campaign, about our needs around infrastructure mm -hmm. in this community. And that really needed to be a priority. Um, That's why I'm in favor of the bonding. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Comments, thoughts? I would. Gosh, it's easy to say I concur with everyone. This is a hard <laughs> decision. Um, you know, I, I think the infrastructure is needed. I think one of the things that I'm struggling with, which um, is probably ironic, the opposite of 
wall a little bit um, is, and, and I'm the person that wants everything, but I feel like we are playing catch up and is that, do, them, do we put all of that catch up right away on the homeowner in that first year? I just, I, that I feel like, Yes, we want everything, but unfortunately, because we are playing catch-up, we're going to have to prioritize. And again, not saying anything's more important than the other because we need roads and safety and parks and all of that. Um, but I'm just I'm struggling with all of it at one time. Um, as much as I'd like to see it, I also, you know, think about the residents out there where maybe things aren't going as good for them. So. So I'd like to, to do a few things here. First, um, I understand that maybe we don't want to do everything at once, and I think that's, that's a good point. Um, but just to talk about the roads, uh, I think that the bond issue at this point is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really catches us up. It allows us to take a breath on some of the other things we have to do. And it also, it, it, it doesn't only, um, obligate the current residents of the town to fix the roads they drive on, but also some of the future residents because it's a 15-year bond. So I think that's spreading that cost to the people who are going to use the road. So I think that's a good idea. To go to this chart, I, I have a couple of suggestions I want to give you right away. One thing we haven't talked about that I put on here, in the budget, we budgeted $40,000 for studies. And, and that's a wage and market study and staff, staffing level studies. Uh, we know now we can probably go, not probably, we can work with the league to uh, talk about if we're in the market or not. They've got some, they do a salary survey, so we should be able to use that. And I think we can postpone any staffing levels because that was really going to concentrate on the building and zoning departments and things like that. So I think that's an easy one for, uh, our, for us to give up and an easy one to take right now. I don't think it'll be a big, huge impact. So I want to start to put some things on there so you can see what happens. So if we remove that, and that's $40,000, that will help. The second issue that I would like to tell you is the pavement improvement fund, or the capital improvement fund, we call it. Now that we, if you decide to bond for $4 million, you can reduce this at least for a while. You Sooner or later, you have to start to fund this I would recommend reducing this to $50,000 this year, next year, with, with the understanding that it'll be $100,000 next year or something along those lines because we need to start to build into that. That and it, we need an opportunity to go through this 10-year infrastructure plan that we talked about and, and then financial model that. So we may have a better idea of where we need to go and what kind of fees can support future road development and capital improvements. So I think, it again, the bonding gives us a breath in a couple of places for us to reanalyze that. So those two things, are, I, I think, are, oops, yeah, are very, very important. And I think you can handle that. As you can see, takes it down to 8.32% right away. Simple little things. And it goes uh, to those kind of numbers for, uh, for the homeowners. So that's the immediate impact of those two things. Well, you know, getting back to the road thing and all this work we need to do on roads, there's a payback on that. It isn't just the bond, the cheap bond. It's the fact that there's less maintenance and less mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And so the, over time, there's a payback there. And I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the argument is over on that particular part of it. Uh, I'm just trying to look at the overall thing and say, listen, this is what we're going to be presenting to the taxpayers, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, do I personally have a problem with it? No. Right. Simple as that. Yeah. The, the one other thing that I want to mention before you start your discussions is um, as far as the proposed street bond goes, we have in here uh, $320,000. Well, the bond repayment schedule in 2020 only calls for $180,000. We put the full amount impact right away. So being that in, when we do this bond, you're really only making an interest payment the first year, and then the next year beyond, you make principal and interest. So we really only need, we need 180,000 next year. So we could reduce this number to 180,000, if you wish. Uh, that means only that we will raise that again the year after, but it will, again, meet the one-to-one -one <coughs> ratio of what we're going to be paying in the bond. 
I think we're just masking reality by, by doing that. Yeah, and, and I just want to show you that what happens if, if you do that. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you would do that, you're at this amount of money. Yeah, that, yeah. So that's an option. I mean, the only reason we put it at the top is because we want to try to level that debt service out as soon as we possibly can because we don't want the fluctuations up and down at debt service. Mm -hmm. it, my philosophy is that they have a level debt service as much as possible so they don't bounce around year to year. So, and it's easier to budget and easier to raise levies. So. Like the farmers used to say, the chickens come home to roost. Yeah. And it's all so I will return that right now to the 320 <laughs> we talked about. Uh, but those other ones I think are, those other two items I think are, are pretty solid and, and you might be able to take those without an issue. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Patrick, but if we're going back to that one-to-one -one ratio yes. with the debt service, when we're not, you know, digging into our fund balance in order to be able to pay, mm -hmm. make those payments, sure. we have an opportunity to build up that fund balance and ultimately or potentially pay cash for some things or pay as you go. Well, uh, with not, not so much in the debt service because the debt service you shouldn't really be adding to your fund balance. You should be... Again, paying it off and what, levying for it, so it should be equal. What you should be able to, what we should be aiming for, in the long run, is to get this capital or the street paving fund on a cash basis, if, if that's possible. Okay. And that's a matter of raising that levy some certain amount every year for the next five years or six years or seven years. I mean, if we did the 250, we would need every year for, for four years. We'd be at about a million dollars and would be happy. However, we also need to look at the franchise fees and, and see if we need to adjust those and what that impact would be. Uh, the difference is, is that uh, not everybody pays property tax and everybody uses electricity and gas for the most part and pays those mm -hmm. fees. Again, I go back to hopefully coming together with a, a total plan, a 10-year plan, and addressing that and doing some of that analysis uh, with how we would fund this. And is it better to do more property tax more franchise fee or a combination of both, or is there another uh, another funding mechanism for doing that? And there are other ones under statute. I mean, no, I won't even tell you what that is because I'll just start the fire going here. So there are other statutory ways you can raise money to, to pave roads, uh, and we can talk about that when we get to that plan. Okay. Well, yeah, I think the other thing that we're not taking into account here, too, is the fact that our city is growing each year. I'm not sure exactly what the total number is every year, but it's, uh, and, it, and of course that adds to our balances mm -hmm. also, so. Sure. So, uh, Patrick, could you um, scroll down a little bit, down back to that, that proposed street bond? Yes. Yeah. Um, The the actual debt service for is one hundred eighty thousand for next year. That's correct. And so, if we were to bond to that amount, essentially, though, we are earmarking for twenty twenty budget. We're going to need to increase that. So, I think it's a, it's a yeah. You'll need of you'll timing. need to add the levy one hundred and forty thousand dollars to the levy next year. <coughs> no matter what, what. I, no, I mean, you're obligating yourself to I don't a like, levy increase next year. I don't like kicking that can down the road. Hmm. But also, it's a matter of kind of easing into. We've got some pretty big numbers on here related to streets on a levy that we've never had street numbers on before. Never. So we've talked about it a lot, but we've never actually. And so, I'm just trying to gauge the appetite on what the um, <coughs> what the right what the right number is. And and I guess in my mind, I'm. I'm saying, I'm thinking, well, it'd be nice to bring that down and be able to fund staff, some of those staffing positions. However, those staffing positions are recurring and they're gonna be in the 2021 20, budget also. So I guess I'm inclined to stick with the full amount. I mean, the other option is, is if you've got $140,000 you gotta add next year, you could split that difference and you know, put another 70,000. But we're talking $18 yeah. on a $250,000 home. Yeah, pretty much. And annual cost. Yep. Yep. For this. Yep. So, seems like a good return on investment to me. And it's a more secure. It's a it's a more secure budget if you've got the full amount in. So let's can we go up to the top again? Um, 
And the positions that are included, so Patrick, you adjusted to take out the wage studies that were in the previous yes. budget plan. Correct. Um, could we run a couple of scenarios with these positions? So code enforcement is currently included as a full-time <coughs> position, is that correct? Yes. So what if we were to back that off, assuming that we're not going to, we've got some organizational work that needs to be done on strategy and teeing up kind of organizationally a, a home for that job. Um, and then if we were, you know, time to recruit, if you we were to put in a half, maybe half a, year. a half year. Yeah, I'm gonna round a little bit, so that's $40,000. And then also, if you're, Taking that out, then what would, what happens if you add in the parks? Full time. Let's start there. You want to start full time and start at three quarters of the year. <clears throat> full time or three quarters? Full time uh, at three quarters. Is that what you mean? Full a full time position for three quarters of the year, assuming okay. we're going to hire in April. And I apologize. I feel like I'm starting to split hairs a little bit. It's okay. So this is probably a wash. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yep. Pretty much. <clears throat> and then just to see full baked in with all of the staffing changes, what if you were to add in the, just to see what it looks like, add in the 32,000 for the police position, which is the budget impact for a full year, assuming that the overtime rates are realized. I'll just again round on that, so. And is that 32,000 assuming a mid-year hire? Yes. Or does it become half that, of that if it's a mid-year hire? Yeah, he's beginning early hire now, right? I forget, huh? we've been through this so many times. Yes, it'd be the full 32,000 mid-year okay. hire. Okay. So where does that end up? Eight, seven, nine. Do we still have the software wrapped into 2020? Well, no. The, the software is independent of the 2020 budget. It has no effect on the levy or anything. It, okay. it, it was, again, just to remind, it was for, from the school funding, <clears throat> uh, conduit funding fee. Okay. And that's, that's uh, obligated. That's, it's, it won't affect your levy at all. Okay. All right. We won't get to say this very much, but it's already, it's already earmarked. It's already funded. Yes. Right? Um, feedback from council. So we've taken, you know, some initial adjustments from that Patrick had recommended. We added in the staffing changes. Thoughts on? I just I have a question. The code enforcement position. You had mentioned that it would take a while to kind of get that set up. Is that? So I'm just wondering, is that something, again, this is kicking it down the road, but the next, the next year and using this year as like a planning year for it? it? It's really up to the council if you want to fund it or not, to be quite honest with you. I mean, it, mm -hmm. would, would we, I mean, yeah, no, it's just if you want to fund it. And we, we'll do it either way. Mm -hmm. We can take whatever it takes to do the job description and outline a program, uh, whether it takes us six months or whether it takes us a year, you can delay that until uh, fiscal year 2021, if you wish. And from an operations perspective, does that feel like a reasonable thing to do? Well, it won't change what we do now. It will, it will uh, we won't get any faster or get more things done, and, and we'll still split some of those duties, like, you know, the fire chief is doing the one and Donovan does others, so we'll just still be status quo, um, and that'll be okay. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's really just a matter of getting there sooner or later, just in knowing that it, it's in your minds or it's somewhere it needs to be done eventually. So if we, where are we at right now? And if we did eliminate that completely, where would that put us? Well, if we eliminated... Can, we, can you look at the before, before you take it out? Let's look at the before. Oh, I'm sorry. So if we were at 8.79 or $45 for a household of 250, 
if we eliminate this now, you're at 8.4. It's negligible. Mm -hmm. option council does have is to you know set a high you know set you know set a preliminary levy number you know go out with that number we have opportunity over the next several months to bring that down before we finalize in December um, that option is on the table Well, obviously, we have another week to think about it, and then obviously a few months to do something about it. But I'm wondering if um, an opportunity to, over the course of the next few months, you know, do our roadshow mm -hmm. and try to get some feedback from our community. Mm -hmm. And um, looks to me like we're gonna be, we could probably do something in somewhere just south of 9% anyways. And then, mm -hmm. to me, that's a really palatable number. It, um, I know Paul isn't quite satisfied with that, but. Um, I, I could live with nine, say. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking at ways to. Right. Patrick, you know, uh, uh, you, you're throwing some numbers in here. You threw in 75,000. I just want to see yeah. what, what it would take to get, uh, it was earlier talked about it. Um, <clears throat> under 6%. So I'm just kind of plugging numbers in. Oops, I did that. Wrong Excuse direction. <laughs> that looks great. <laughs> Group spreadsheet work is always fun, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's sizable. Yeah. It'd be tough. We got a long way to go. So. Uh, Do that, we? That's why it makes me feel like that halftime <laughs> position for the um, code enforcement is, mm -hmm. you know, it's just so negligible at that point. Right. Yeah. You know, like it's well, a big it, impact on the budget, and operationally, we're not getting much yeah. out of it. And you'll, and you'll have an right. opportunity to find out if it has any effect right. or if it really right. works and whether right. or not mm -hmm. you can right. want to keep, keep going with it. Do we want to take that out? And then <clears throat> do we want to take that out? Because then I've got another another item that we might want to consider as well. I'm just finding something here. Take out that code enforcement role and then. We're playing a little bit with pennies here, but it is impactful. We are taking a kind of a triple hit on the pavement improvement fund. One is we're bonding. Mm -hmm. Second, we're going to fully fund the debt service for that, which is you know fiscally responsible and the right thing to do, but not a requirement. Do we also do the fifty dollar fifty thousand pavement improvement fund? I guess. You know, the question is, do we want to tackle the whole hurdle, or are there, is there a incremental? I mean, you've that done payment and improvement fund is I, sitting think, at zero today, correct? I think we should leave that number in there. I, but my personal opinion, I see that fifty as kind of the beginning of a college fund, and then we're yeah. going to build on that. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, again, in the context of a ten million dollar budget, it's pretty. I know negligible, Espe really. especially when it's building. It's mm -hmm. it, it it needs a line item for future, which right. And it's the core services we should be focused on. So. I liked Kat, uh, Councilmember Bystrom's suggestion of um, you know setting. I'm not sure if this is exactly what you said or not, but setting the levy high and then taking this out to the community and letting them weigh in on it of what what do they see as the priorities because mm -hmm. um, it, it's really hard for me to to not fund the police captain especially with the increase in mental health and the opioid um, not having the infrastructure su to support that and it's also hard for me not to fund that park and rec support because i've i've seen that need mm -hmm. And, and I and I do like the idea of some additional patrols. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about the need for some additional patrol throughout the city, so that right. is appealing to me as well. Yeah, there's several cities struggling with that right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really are. exactly. Right. And 
back then to the view of the average homeowner, um, it's hard for me to say, yes, we can save you $10 if we don't do these other things over the course of a year. I'd rather pay the $10 and do the things because um, it is all part of the package of what we said we wanted to do. So. Yeah, and the message really is the impact on the tax bill, not the percentage of the, the levy. Right, right, I mean, exactly. I mean, that's always, right. in this business, that's always kind of a misleading number, mm -hmm. and everybody uses it, but it's really the, in, the dollar impact more than it is the percentage of the levy increase. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have this in your back pocket or not, but remember those numbers, there's always two numbers to talk about. One is the levy increase, which is important, but then the other is the tax capacity rate. Correct. So we knew that the 7.55% actually brought our tax capacity rate down. This number that can't be, I mean, tax capacity rate has to be still fairly flat. Yeah, the, the, if it's on the chart, we have the revised one from uh, next on the left. Oh, there the it pink is. one yep, was 39.5. Yep. We proposed 40.8 um, and it goes to 41.2. I don't have that chart in, in front of me, but um, that it's really starting to level off your capacity, mm -hmm. your your debt capacity com level. Um, it's coming down for so many years, but this will more or less and flatline we, it. I think I wish I had that in front of me, but I don't. Remember also, Council um, Council Member um, Gerard mentioned this at the beginning that our the first budget workshop where we're at forty one percent with this proposed have kind of a hefty levy for this year. Um, that's still significantly underneath our bunch benchmark communities, which were most of them were in the 44 to 46% range. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, and then even some of our outstate um, counterparts were up in the 50% range. So, which I think is another very important talking point. I agree. Right. So, I'm not advocating we get up to those numbers. No, <laughs> just to be clear. No, no, no it's helpful it for is, you to it point is that out. There's no question about it, Paul. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's where that balance is. You know, the get, let's let's be be reasonable, um, but get some things done, right? That we need to get done. Well, it is true that we can back off. You know, if, if that's there's right. if there's negative, uh, just how bad, mm -hmm. just how negative it gets, I guess, and. Uh, <clears throat> I sure value everybody's opinion, though I do. It's right. a lot easier for me to right. think about what needs to go here, and and um, boy, when you're so far behind on things, uh, it's the way it is. Right. So one of the other things to think about, Council, is what else do we need to see from staff before next week? Because next week we will need somebody will need to make a motion, and we'll need to vote and approve on a. Um, on a rate, on a preliminary levy. Um, so what information do we want to see before or as part of next week's meeting or do we feel like we've got sufficient information tonight? I think the only thing I would like to see is what's the total impact to, for 2021? You know, some of these numbers are less this year because they're going to start late. Um, we yeah. have some other issues. So what would the number look like full octane, for lack of a better term. Yep. Make sure we're Yeah, that's easy. That's, that's smart. smart. Make sure we're Just so I make sure that 20, yeah. when we are here in another year, that we're already behind the eight ball. Right. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Agree. Anything else we would like to see from staff? <clears throat> Not hearing any. Thank you to Patrick and team. I know this yeah. has been a lot of work and a lot of you put a lot of hours into this, so thank you. It's great to be at this point. Um, we talked a little bit about the need for you know, a roadshow, get some information out there. Dan, I'm assuming this, is this your graphic? The does a great job of teeing up the bond issuance. Um, I think it'd be helpful to talk through a communication plan of what we would like to do between now and that um, truth and taxation hearing, which will be which will be our first meeting in December. Assuming that we pass the preliminary levy on Monday, um, certainly there's opportunities for each of us to get in front of the boards and commissions that we're a part of, you know, 
flaw school district watershed district gather input at those at those sessions um, I'd like to talk about scheduling a potentially a informal coffee I don't know if it's coffee with council coffee with the mayor um, we probably want to avoid having a quorum there um, or we either need to announce it's going to be a full meeting and I guess that's maybe my question is does council want to be involved in any sort of a um, an official meeting where we would have it teed up with a quorum of council or do we <coughs> would we rather have kind of a smaller round table where a quorum is not present and it's more of an informal meeting thoughts these are clear these workshops are all clearly um, you know, open to the public and that information is all available but I do think we want to take an incremental effort in getting some extra word out there um, trying to explain information before those um, levy notices go out <clears throat> I'm open to feedback I think all of the above yeah. um, I also think um, it's important for us in terms of um, kind of the work that we're doing with our local papers um, to be sure that we're kind of driving um, that communication in a way that's easily understood to our community. Mm -hmm. So often you see numbers and percents and all of that kind of thing. And um, um, you know, this is this is drilling it down and simplifying it. I think in a way that is pretty easily understood. And I think it's going to be really important for us to um, kind of get ahead of that too, as well. I can certainly. Um, reach out specifically to Ryan. He does a, right. he does a nice job, um, but we can reach out specifically and make sure he's yep. got specifics, he especially as I think as of tonight, we've kind of got some numbers that are starting to gel. Right. Um, so we can certainly do a reach out there. Also, um, the, the um, Forest Lake Times provides an opportunity for a mayor's column once every quarter, and um, we were, I worked with Dan to get some messaging on just overall what we were considering for a bonding, um, and so that will be coming up in the upcoming issue as well. However, it's very um, conceptual because we hadn't had this meeting yet. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the actual overall financial impact, but just talking about kind of a recap of 2019, what we've done so far, and then looking ahead to 2020 at a very high level. Um, but certainly that's all at a very high level and something that we need to kind of get to the next level of detail. Mm -hmm. I, um, I also like the idea of having access to these kinds of documents that I can utilize on my social media pages, both personal and council. Um, so something relative maybe to the overall picture um, in addition to this one would be really helpful. Again, the, the visuals and the talking points do you want maybe a two page or one page? This is really nice to really describe yes. The, yes. the debt issuance of what's happening or the bond issuance. Second piece would be nice to just understand what's happening overall operationally with the general fund. Um, that there's, there's some additional positions that we're investing in and we can kind of illustrate out um, the, the general fund increase. I, go ahead, Dan. It's kind of basically maybe another one of these, but more specific to general fund. Or the operating fund. The operating, operating fund. I mean, <laughs> and I can, yeah, I mean, that can be definitely crafted up. I, I think one of the reasons why I didn't dive into that was the numbers were still pretty fluid mm -hmm. on this so one. So once that kind of gets locked in, I can definitely, after next Monday, mm -hmm. take what comes out of that meeting where that lands <laughs> and then create one of those. Like, <coughs> pull the highlight points out. But I think, you know, referencing the recommendations of CPSM around that, you know, the structure of the PD, talking about strategic planning and the focus on communication and, you know, some additional support for parks, lakes, and trails. I think it moves it beyond just us sitting up here as a team, um, that we're listening to our community and we're listening to the experts and um, including those that are sitting on all ends of us here. Um, around our roads and, and, and water infrastructure as well, and the importance of the refinance because it's just the right thing to do um, in the context of saving the city money overall. Right. Good. So. In terms of a coffee with council, um, coffee with council session or a whatever we would whatever we would do for some sort of a public meeting. Um, Thoughts around, do we have it be an official event that is court noticed and we have all five of us? Do we want to break up into a couple of different sessions? Um, how might you want to, any preference? I'd like to see it done in an open house format. 
you know, mm -hmm. where we have a presentation, you know, lead with a presentation and then a and a session. Um, Plans, and, and two then sessions think, similar to what we did for strategic planning. I just say that and you've got two different dates, maybe a morning session and then an e evening session to mm -hmm. kind of take yeah. advantage of different schedules. And if council's able to be there, great. And if not, trying to get all five of us on this, two different mm -hmm. sessions might be right. a bit. Um, and maybe a personal invite out to that strategic planning list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. No, um, start there because they can be great ambassadors for us, kind of carrying information out to their networks within the community. Okay. And then I think identifying potential places to take this as well, you know, chamber, rotary, yep. so on and so forth. Other suggestions? I think, that, I think that's, that's a great, um, that's a great, a great list. We can, I can work with Patrick and Dan on some dates, um, and float those by council for availability, and then we can start penciling in. You know, certainly each of your um, liaison positions help to get the message out and um, you know, supported by information that's going to come from Dan on just overall communications and some materials to support. I, I will, um, I will mention that I did um, at the. Uh, senior center board meeting talk a little bit about our proposal to bond and the reasons why um, and it was really met with some positive feedback but so I think an opportunity to to get out there will be really helpful I had similar feedback from the rotary um, when we had and I was just going through first draft numbers at that point um, but also some positive feedback as well so. I think there is some recognition out there that we do have some need. Okay, any anything else related to budget? No. Not hearing any. I will enter. In, if so, anything else to come before council? Not hearing any. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Second. Motion a second. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed. And we're adjourned.